Good morning, Palliative Care Nation. You say palliative, I say palliative, but let's not call the whole thing off. Let's do turn off anything that rings. And while there is no photography, video, or recording allowed, other than um, by those with whom we've professionally contracted, um, we know, and we do know who they are, you are encouraged to live tweet. Let's get this trending, and let's get started. Dental People, Regis College President, Dr. Antoinette Hayes. Robin, where are you? <laughs> well, welcome to Regis College. It is really my honor to be able to uh, preside over this event today, and um, it is such a pleasure to welcome all of you to Regis College and to the Casey Theater. We know there'll be a few more people coming in as the program begins, but, um, and feel free, please come down and, and take a seat. In addition to our wonderful guest, Dr. Ira Bayok, I'd also like to uh, welcome Dr. Lashlyn Faro, Chair of the Governor's Expert Panel on End-of-Life Care, who's also here with us today. All of you fellow professionals, friends, neighbors, and colleagues, welcome. What we are doing here today is helping to change the world, right, Ira? Change a way of thinking to create a new culture regarding palliative care and advanced planning. With over 2,000 students, Regis College is invested in the future and in that kind of change not only because higher education looks to the rising generations, but because the Regis College School of Nursing Science and Health Professions is defining the high standard in healthcare education in Greater Boston and New England as a twice named Center of Excellence in Nursing Education, awarded by the National League of Nursing. This means that here at Regis, we are deeply committed to the health and well-being of our community at large. We at Regis also embrace community partners. Dr. Furrow, for example, participated in our end-of-life expert panel at the Regis College Presidential Lex Lecture Series. Dr. Bayok, I have met you on several occasions but the best one and the most important memory I have is of our meeting together in 1983, I think it was, in New York City, when we were at a, a panel together to brainstorm about how to add end-of-life curriculum to medical education. Where are we at today? I think we've come some far away, right? We've, we've, come, we've come away. Today, Regis is proud to partner with the Parmenta Foundation, Parmenta Home Care and Hospice, and Honoring Choices of Massachusetts for our inaugural community collaboration for change. We all share the commitment with Dr. Ira Bayok to make sure that we can provide the best care possible. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Cindy Mayer, Executive Director of the Parmenta Foundation, and Denise McQuaid, Parmenta's CEO, Ellen DiPaolo, and Kathy Hunkel, co-founders of Honoring Choices of Massachusetts. Please join me in kicking off a conference dedicated to changing transformatively and in measurable ways how we care for, our, for our, one another throughout life. Cindy. It's good to be with you this morning. 
We're gathered to learn from and be inspired by Dr. Ira Bayok, a physician on a quest to transform care through the end of life. The hope is that we, as fellow change agents, will contribute to this great quest in our individual and corporate circles of care and influence. I'm reminded of another man, Jonathan Maynard Parmenter, a tall, quiet bachelor cattleman who at the turn of the 20th century cared so deeply about his community that he too had a plan. At the end of his life, he bequeathed monies so that his family, neighbors, and friends in Wayland and the surrounding communities could have high quality, accessible health care where they lived. His mission was bold, to do anything and everything expedient or incidental for the benefit and maintenance of the health, welfare, and education of the residents of Wayland and the vicinity. His quest has become the mission of today's Parmenter Community Healthcare. Parmenter is now 60 years bold, and we continue to strive to meet the changing needs of the communities we serve. We are proud to partner with Regis College and Honoring Choices Massachusetts to host today's gathering so that we, as residents, providers, policymakers, faith leaders, educators, and students, the recipients, health care providers, and leaders of tomorrow might collaborate for lasting change and how we care for one another up until the end of life. Today, Parmenter Home Care and Hospice is led by Denise McQuaid, CEO. As Cindy mentioned, Parmenter is 60 years old. We have served thousands of patients through our home care agency and through hospice services, both in folks' home as well as in our 10 suite hospice residence in Whalen. But our mission is also community health and education. When we first partnered with Regis College and invited Dr. Bayok to speak at a public education forum, he agreed on one condition that it was not for just one presentation. He wanted to create a forum for sustainable change. So does Parmenter, so does Regis, so does Honoring Choices. So following this morning's presentation, Dr. Bayok is leading four roundtable discussions with leaders who have the power to create, promote, and sustain this new way of thinking about palliative care and end of life. The first round table is with clinical school educators from three medical schools, five nursing schools, and social worker schools regarding incorporating palliative care and end-of-life principles into school curriculums. Next, Dr. Bayok is meeting with hospital leadership to discuss what best practice programs need to be in every acute care facility in order to ensure that patients' wishes are fulfilled. This afternoon, 10 palliative care physicians, as well as nurse practitioners, social workers, and nurses, will have the chance to exchange ideas, challenges, and opportunities in their practices with Dr. Bayok. And tomorrow morning, Dr. Bayok is meeting with business leaders and major insurance companies to discuss how advanced care planning can, be, can improve quality and cost-effective health premiums for businesses. In addition to these four roundtables, an exciting forum this evening is being held for students. We have 84 students coming to meet with Dr. Bayok, 16 medical students from three different medical schools, 35 nursing students from five nursing schools, 20 social workers, and then other majors. They will have the opportunity to meet with Dr. Bayok for a lively exchange of the future of health care in this field. I'm sure we'll all leave inspired. We invited change agents to the roundtables and to this morning's forum. What each of us can do to build a brighter future 
is the question we need to be asking ourselves. We make two suggestions on today's program, and we invite each of you to fill in the blank. Every day, Parmenter clinicians experience firsthand patients and families who have planned and those who have not. So here's how we are filling in the blanks. As a provider and an employer, Parmenter has made a commitment. As a provider, all of our clinicians will have the tools they need to initiate the advanced care planning process with those of for whom they care. As a not-for-profit, we have committed that 100% of our board will have access and opportunities to engage in advanced care planning. And as an employer, all of our employees will have the education and opportunity to develop an advanced care plan for themselves and their families. We are partnering with Honoring Choices for this support and education, which is a great segue for me to introduce Ellen DePaula and Kathy Hankel, co-founders of Honoring Choices Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, I'm Ellen DePaulo. And my name's Kathy Hankel, and we're the co-founders of Honoring Choices Massachusetts. Honoring Choices is the brand new, consumer-oriented nonprofit here in Massachusetts. Our mission is to inform, empower, and to help people, <clears throat> excuse me, make a health care plan and get connected to person-centered care, not just at the end of life, but all through their life. Our website provides information, tools, and a three-step planning guide to what we like to call explore, plan, and connect. Explore what's right for you, make a plan using Massachusetts documents, and connect to care so your choices are well-defined and, most importantly, honored. And we take that information and those tools, and we work with the community. We give them to community groups, to care professionals, to health care providers, so that they can provide the hands-on care to people right in their community. You know, we're so fortunate in Massachusetts. We have so many people working on this shared mission for a long time. And what we do is partner with those groups. We meet them right where they are. We say, how can we customize these tools so that you can integrate them into your system? For example, our community partners can be faith-based groups, senior centers, or businesses who can start a group discussion and use our planning tools to make a plan. Healthcare providers or senior living centers who can become health care planning facilitators with the knowledge and skill to engage adults in ongoing planning conversation or nursing programs to help enhance nursing curriculum in these areas. So we have practical tools and we have sustainable programs and our community partners are doing already, we're just about six months old here, such fabulous things right to help people with hands-on uh, care and planning then the partners are actually working together in networks, community by community, throughout the state. So as I say, we're just getting started. Kathy and I invite you to go look at the Honoring Choices website. You can make your own plan, or you can join us as a community partner. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you, Ellen and Kathy. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Ira Bayok. Dr. Bayok is a palliative care physician, author, and a consistent advocate for voice and rights of dying patients and their families. He is a professor of medicine at the Giesel School of Medicine at Dartmouth where he also served as Director of Palliative Medicine at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center for 10 years. Dr. Bayok has been involved in hospice and palliative care since 1978, so I was pretty close, 1983, right? When during his residency, he helped find found a hospice home care program in Fresno, California. During the 90s, he was co-founder and principal investigator 
for the Missoula Demonstration Project, a community-based organization in Montana dedicated to research and transformation of the end-of-life experience locally and as a demonstration of what is possible nationally. He is a past president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and from 1986 through 2006, he served as Director for Promoting Excellence in End-of-Life Care, a national program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Bayok has authored numerous articles on the ethics and practices of hospice, palliative, and end-of-care, end-of-life care. His books include Dying Well, which I have an author, an author signed copy, The Four Things That Matter Most, and most recently, which I also have an author signed copy, The Best Care Possible, A Physician's Quest to Transform Care Through the End of Life. Dr. Bayok has earned national recognition for his work, receiving numerous awards, and he has been a featured guest on national television and radio programs, including NPR, All Things Considered, Talk of the Nation, and On Being, CBS 60 Minutes, Fox and Friends, and PBS The News Hour. Dr. Bayok calls these unprecedented times, offering both challenges and opportunities and challenging all of us to be sure that we provide the best care ever. He calls us to a brighter future. Please help me welcome Dr. Ira Bayon. Logistics are over. Welcome, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's always hard to hear one's, um, oneself um, introduced in such glowing fashion. It, it's it's anxiety-provoking. Um, uh, this isn't about me. None of this is about me, really. This is all about us, about how we're going to live through the very end of life as fully as well as possible. Um, I am delighted to be here. I, um, the, what Denise McQuaid described is pretty much what happened. Dr. Uh, Hayes, who I've known, uh, Professor Hayes, who I've, President Hayes, sorry, who I've known for many years, uh, as she mentioned, um, uh, called and, and indeed asked me to speak. And I said, well, yeah, that's fine, but I'll come and hopefully people will clap and then I'll leave and nothing will change. And we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, many of us, uh, President Hayes, myself, uh, Lachlan Faro, and others, we've been working on these issues since, since the Dead Sea was merely ill. <laughs> We're still doing it, and, but, but um, things haven't changed enough. Um, so this morning is about just sort of reviewing where we're at and where we might be going, and then we've got work to do the rest of the day, and you folks have work to do in this community, in the larger, um, not only the community of Weston, but in Massachusetts, which is a remarkable place, and you can use what you do here in Massachusetts, in fact, to change the world. I, I mean that very literally. So let's start. We live in unprecedented times. There's about to be more older people than younger people on the planet for the first time in human history. This is unprecedented, and, and this is a good thing, by the way. This isn't a bad thing. This is a remarkable thing. It's partly remarkable because of what we've done in, in healthcare, of what medicine has done. We've been saving lives. People now live longer than ever before, right? It's a miracle. I love interventional medicine, but the problem is we have yet to make one person immortal. What we have done is make it harder to die than ever before in human history. People are sicker before they die than ever before in human history. 
You know, we used to die quickly of heart failure, first episode of heart failure, or cancer was a, a three-week diagnosis for most people. End-stage renal disease, when I was growing up, was predictably fatal. Now we've got two or three different types of renal replacement therapy. You know, so people are actually sicker before they die. And it's harder to die. It's harder to know when dying has started because we have so, such good diagnostics and therapeutics. We've been making it harder for families because, frankly, not only are people living longer, but we've been um, having fewer babies. We've been living further from our families of origin. And many of us, even in our you know, grayness, have been uh, living in two job couples and sometimes three job couples just to make the ends meet to pay for somebody's college tuition, children or grandchildren's, and to pay for health insurance and the like. Now, all of this is still a good, because, but it's unprecedented. We don't have easy examples of what to do to live fully. And of course, healthcare has become its own national problem. It is, the, the costs of healthcare are, are reaching 20% of our entire economy, sapping our ability to maintain infrastructure of schools and pay adequate teacher salaries and build roads and railroads and high-speed internet access and on and on and on and on and on that we need for our health and well-being and certainly for those of us who are of a certain age, for the well-being of our children and their children. This quote really helped start the hospice movement in the, the UK. The dissatisfied dead cannot noise abroad the negligence they have experienced. This was written by a physician and sociologist, Dr. John Hinton, when he studied the way Britons were dying after World War II. He described human warehouses where people existed more than lived. And he said the dissatisfied dead cannot noise abroad the negligence they have experienced. This really energized Britons to embrace something different, a hospice movement where people were, got the best of medical treatment but were honored and celebrated through the very end of life. Let me suggest that the crisis still persists today. Despite all that we have done in healthcare and the great advances of hospice and palliative care, which has importantly proved that it is possible to give much better care much better care to people through the end of life. In fact, for many, many Mer Americans, they're still not getting it. That's not an allegation on my part. Just look at some of the current literature. This is from our colleague Joan Tino and, and Susan Miller, et cetera, and my colleagues at Dartmouth and David Goodman and, and uh, Nancy Morden. Um, uh, deaths, this is just over 2000 to 2009, notice that um, deaths in acute care hospitals have dropped from 32 to 25 percent, but ICU deaths has actually increased to almost 30 percent of people experiencing ICU use in the last month of life. Hospice use has increased, though the um, uh, length of stay in hospice has shrunk dramatically from 19 to 21 days, uh, from 21 days a median to 19 to 17, and early reports now it's down to 14 days of hospice care as a median. That's not end of life care as much as brink of death care. Um, and, and burdensome transitions during the last 30 days of life have actually increased substantially. Um, so there's really a, a problem here. Now, um, they concluded that among Medicare beneficiaries, a lower proportion died in acute care hospitals during this decade, although ICU use and the rate of healthcare transitions increased during the last month of life. Um, cancer care was supposed to be the canary in the gold mine, or the coal mine, rather. Um, this is where we've been putting most of our energies. Hospice really, you know, in a sense, uh, developed in response to cancer deaths, people dying badly even though it was an expected end-of-life experience. People dying in hospitals, often in pain, too often alone. This is recent data from the Dartmouth Atlas. Despite the increased frequency of end-of-life discussions, cancer care has become more aggressive in general as people approach the end of life. Regardless of the cause, the findings suggest um, that there is more work to be done to ensure that the wishes of cancer patients facing the end of their lives are elicited, understood, and honored. That's a serious you know, understated but serious uh, um, statement from uh, these researchers. It gets more dramatic than that. The Institute of Medicine just in September delivered a recent report looking at cancer care through the end of life. Just look at the, the title of the IOM's report. 
you know, charting a new course for a system in crisis. Folks, for the Institute of Medicine to use a word crisis in their title, things have to be bad. These people are not prone to hyperbole. Cancer care is often not as patient-centered, accessible, coordinated, or evidence-based as it could be. Folks, let's just be honest with ourselves as we continue this conversation. The canary has died. The environment of healthcare remains toxic to the most vulnerable, sickest patients in our healthcare system. We need to do better, and things aren't going to get easier, they're going to get worse because cancer care and, and end-of-life care are still getting harder. Treatments are still getting better. That's also a good thing, but it's unprecedented, and we have to figure out how to work with it more. It's not just for the highly vulnerable patients. Some of you may recognize this gentleman. At the latter part of, of Walter Isaacson's book, Steve Jobs, the following paragraph uh, can be found. Quote, the following Saturday afternoon, Jobs allowed his wife Powell to convene a meeting of his doctors. He realized that he was facing the type of problem he never would have permitted at Apple. His treatment was fragmented rather than integrated. Each of his myriad maladies was being treated by different specialists, but they weren't being coordinated in a cohesive approach. Quote, one of the big issues in the healthcare industry is the lack of caseworkers or advocates that are quarterbacks of each team, Powell said. So that was particularly true at Stanford, at Stanford, where nobody was seemed to be in charge of figuring out how nutrition was related to pain or to oncology. So Powell gathered the various Stanford specialists to come to their home for a meeting. And that meeting resulted in a new regimen for dealing with pain and coordinating the other treatments. The jobs had to coordinate their own care by bringing specialists to their home at Stanford which has a robust palliative care program, by the way. Something is wrong. Let me suggest that despite all of the good intentions, and they are good intentions, of our colleagues in hospice and palliative care, and our colleagues in hospital administration, and, and, and health care in general, um, we haven't been getting very far. It's just time to reboot. I suggest that we've been bringing the wrong tools to the job. You know? We, Parachutes save lives. We don't give parachutes to sailors. They're not, you know, life-saving in the Navy, right? It's as if we've all been working um, to fix the medical aspects of end-of-life experience, but it's a little bit like trying to drive a screw with a hammer and a pair of pliers. You can be really hard at work and you can be making the most earnest efforts, but you're going to make a mess of things. It's just not going to go very well. I think that's the best analogy that I can, I can um, suggest to what we've been doing. Because we've been misperceiving the experience of illness, caregiving, dying, and grief as being fundamentally medical. They are not fundamentally medical. And you know that, you know, Confucius said, you know, wisdom, the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper names. Let's just start there. Illness, caregiving, dying, and grief are fundamentally personal. In, intimately so for individuals who are going through the experience. Yes, people who are seriously ill have medical problems to be addressed. Of course they do. But that doesn't change the fundamental nature of illness and caregiving and dying and grief. They are personal. And until we recognize and start teaching students that these are fundamentally personal experiences, which, during which we need to bring an, our medical expertise and our nursing and clinical expertise to address medical components of these experiences, but it's not the thing itself. These are not medical, they're intensely personal for the individual and for everyone who loves that person. Whenever an individual receives a serious diagnosis, his or her family shares in the illness. That's part of human life. That's almost a, a fundamental dictum of human life. We belong to one another. This is a uh, get to know me poster. This is something, by the way, it was developed at Mass General. It was under a uh, grant that uh, I was hel helped to administer for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. But this is something that the ICU teams at, at Mass General developed, and we uh, uh, adopted it for uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock. A get to know me poster. This gentleman came in, Mo, we didn't know his name. He came in at 0072 because he was found down by a uh, crushed bicycle helmet and, and, and bicycle, obviously in an accident, uh, airlifted to Dartmouth. For the first 24 hours, he, there was no name on his chart. 
And then his family was uh, notified and they came. And with this get to know me poster, it populate, we populated, we, we delivered him from anonymity, as my colleague Ned Kassam would say. Very interesting. We found out he was a whole person. And this poster changed everything, everybody who walked in the room, from the housekeepers to the nurses to the social workers to the um, uh, critical care team to the neurosurgery team realized they were taking care of a whole person. It, it humanized the experience just because we knew who he was. Now, these days, we, we have the tools to get more assertive about changing how people are cared for. We have, this is a remarkable tool, the Institute of Medicine's uh, IOM report, Crossing the Quality uh, Chasm, chaired by no, none other than Don Berwick, who's now gonna be running for governor, by the way. Um, the IOM gave us a framework for defining what quality is. Quality care is safe, effective, patient-centered, importantly, timely, efficient, and equitable. Um, you know, I use the phrase the best care possible because it's the only thing that I know in our highly diverse society everybody wants. When you or someone you love is seriously ill, their life is threatened, you want the best care possible. So I use that as an empty vessel into which we'll pour specific meaning. Because of course, the best care isn't one size fits all. So I found myself for years saying these things to new patients. I want to make sure that you receive the best care possible. In addition to all the treatments for this disease, that includes attending to your symptoms and your sense of well-being. In focusing on your physical health, I don't want to ignore how this illness affects your personal life, your feelings, your hopes, your fears, as well as those of your family, right? I need to know who this person is, not just what their diagnoses and their comorbidities and their functional status is. That's important. I, know, I need to know who they are as a person, what motivates them, what they like, what they don't like, what has meaning for them, what matters most now. You know, when I teach medical students and residents about quality, I say quality care has to first conform to recommendations and best practice guidelines by the associations that we look to for, for guidance, that we all pay dues to. Those should be based on evidence when possible from randomized controlled trials or meta-analyses, and when that evidence doesn't exist on expert opinion and consensus guidelines. But that's only gets you so far down the road. The best care, real quality care, has to be consistent with the individual and family's values, preferences, and priorities. If it's, not, if it's not consistent, then it's just medical science. Medical science doesn't become medical care until it is applied in a way that is of value to the individuals being cared for, right? It has to be responsive to their needs. This, by the way, is my dad. Seymour Biox. Some of you will have read Dying Well, which starts with his story. This was in 1981 in Fresno, California, when he was living with and dying from pancreatic cancer. I have him up there, and some of you who've heard me speak will recognize this slide because it's in many of the things that I, I talk about. I have him there for two reasons. One, if my dad's picture is above my shoulder, I have to be telling you the truth. <laughs> At least I believe what I'm saying. But also, it's, it's to remind me, to remind you that we're all in this one together. This isn't about me, this is about us. And everybody is highly individual. This is intensely personal. What was the best care for my dad might be entirely wrong for somebody of the same age, same diagnoses, but a different worldview, a different ethnicity, different traditions, different idiosyncrasies than my dad had. The best care takes preparation and conversation. That's why we're here, right? As my friend Lachlan Faro has said, it's always too soon until it's too late. You denied being the origin of that, but I credit you for that. But, that's, but that, doesn't that encapsulate the culture? It's always too soon until it's too late. I've had these conversations with so many people in the ICU who, although Joe had COPD or liver failure for you know, years, we weren't, we weren't prepared for this. We never thought this would happen. Well, you know, that's a, not a, only a failure from, of, on the part of their clinicians, but it's a failure on the part of the culture. You know, we have yet to make one person immortal. That doesn't mean that we should give up on treatments. It means that we need to, there's tension between disease modifying treatments and treatments that involve care for human beings through the very end of life. We know now that we're having the conversation more often. Honoring choices is, is such a wonderful 
a community-based effort to do just that. Ellen Goodman's Conversation Project, and in and full dis uh, disclosure, I'm an unpaid advisor to the Conversation Project, is making it normative to have the conversation. This stuff is now up on the web. You can download, people can download um, forms. Everplans.com is another wonderful resource with just-in-time uh, uh, tools for not only having advanced care planning conversations, but planning funerals, even legal and fiscal matters. Uh, they, can, they do long-range planning or just-in-time planning. It's a wonderful free um, set of resources. I'm a supporter of this uh, a game uh, that people can play, My Gift of Grace. I got involved with them because I gave a small donation when they were a Kickstarter project and they've now developed and are you know, making this available. Notice that they're involved in crowdsourcing too. They're pushing people to National Healthcare Decisions Day, which is this Wednesday, right? Um, there's another game we ju I just was made aware of, Go, Go Wish. It's a card game where you can play with families to get them to engage in what they would want if certain things happen. Now, this is important because you know doctors still aren't enamored with advanced directives. They hate, frankly, to talk about advanced directives. You know, because they misperceive it. They think that, that somehow it has to, it's a, it's a plan of care, or it's a prescription for care, or it's a do not resuscitate order, or it's a comfort measure only order. They're none of those things. Advanced directives are tools to interview people and, and organize our, and, and express our preferences, and to empower families to talk for the person that they love. I, I used to say, this is a way for you to keep control of your body if you can't speak for yourself. I don't say that anymore. This is a way to project your caring into the future. So you're caring for your family when they may be left struggling with decisions about your treatment and care. You can't stop that, but maybe you can lift a little bit of the burden that they feel. You know, This is, in, this is about caring for well for one another through the very end of life. Of course, the best care takes competent and caring physicians. We need physicians who are skilled in the physiology and the pharmacology of treating disease. We need um, physicians who understand the ethics of decision making. We need physicians who actually derive satisfaction from caring for seriously ill people. Not all physicians do. Some physicians, colleagues that I know and value, are, are more comfortable in their labs than in the clinic. And that has to be okay. But when I or someone I love is seriously ill, or a patient I care for is seriously ill, I want to refer them to a physician who actually derives professional satisfaction from caring for people through serious illness, through the very end of life. Many of us here in the roundtables today are going to be talking about training new generation of clinicians. And that's different because, you know, clinical training has to change, as does this as does this advancer, um, hmm. um, because the world is changing. So the changing roles of clinicians need to be, you know, brought in, uh, and, and clinicians in general. I put physicians here because I'm a physician, and, and it seems only right that I talk about uh, medical training mostly. But we need to be able to integrate multiple sources of information. On, a, on not only major data sets and big data and the literature, but also patient-centered data, which is gonna come uh, ever more fast and furious. Look at all the different things that new physicians uh, are gonna need to, to know, particularly working collaboratively in teams, because increasingly, caring is a team sport. Working collaboratively among different specialty teams, knowing how to communicate and negotiate um, plans of care with patients and families, but also with other clinical teams. Guiding and advising people through difficult circumstances, advocating for people through a wacky healthcare system and set of social services and community-based services which are increasingly hard to access. Being willing to be open, knowing fully that your outcomes are gonna be reported and are gonna be up on .gov or some other website so that citizens and consumers can make informed choices. Interacting with patients not just as individuals, but as persons. Things are changing rapidly. He says, do you want the pill, the suppository, the patch, or the app? You know? I gotta tell you, it, it's not as fanciful as one might think. Things are getting really um, different out there, and people are prescribing apps, and prescribing you know, reading uh, uh, to patients and families that they need to do. 
whatever you do, please don't mention Dr. Oz. <laughs> because some of the information he gives is just plainly awful. Now, at the kernel of the best care, and I mean this quite literally, at the very center of the best care is shared decision making. It's, it's an irreducible component of quality care. You can quote me on that. But you know, this has changed dramatically over the time that I've been on the planet. I was born in 1951 when I was growing up. Shared decision making happened when the doctor shared his decisions with you. <laughs> and when he did, and it was almost always a he, when he did, it was as if nature itself had spoken. It wasn't an opinion. He was simply conveying the facts to you who couldn't read the natural signs. Your father is dying. That was that. The father is dying. Nowadays, we say, who are you again? What, like, can I see your name tag? Well, we're not going to take that here. We're going to, you know, we're going to the deaconess. You know, or we're going to Sloan Kettering. We're not taking that, in, you know. Right? But nowadays we realize that decision making is best done collaboratively with patients and families. I am hopefully expert in the diagnostics and therapeutics, but the patients and families are already expert in their personhood, in their ethnicity, in their values, preferences, and priorities. And it's only until we can meld the two and I can bring my expertise to their expertise that we can come out with a plan that we all recognize is the best care plan for this person at this point in time. And then we simply get together again as time passes or the uh, condition changes. It takes teamwork. Now, my definition of palliative care is here. It's interdisciplinary care for persons with life-threatening illness or injury, which addresses physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs, and seeks to improve quality of life for the ill person with his or her family. Physical, emotional, social, and spiritual are the domains of personhood. Not patienthood, personhood. That's what makes us whole. This is our team at, oops, no, that's not our team. There you go. This is our team at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, which meets every weekday morning to run the list. This is our palliative care team. Run the list of the patients that were in the house that we're seeing in the hospital, who we're going to see in clinic, who pending consults, people who have died since we last met, if it's Monday since Friday or every day or overnight, and just bring, the, bring people up to speed. This is where magic happens. We don't tromp around as a five-member or six-member team to see every patient, but this is where uh, magic happens because each member of different disciplines gets to input their creativity. You know, this is why the, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Synergy happens, creative collaboration happens to provide the best care for each person. Look at all the components of what we call palliative care. The same can be said for hospice. There, it's, it goes by one label, but there are so many different aspects of care that we provide through this rubric of palliative care. So much of it is value clarification, shared decision making, you know, creative goals of care, um, advanced care planning, including completing uh, advanced directives and requisite forms if they're not already done. Yes, monitoring and management of symptoms and, and, and uh, of suffering. Um, in using the very best diagnostics and therapeutics to alleviate the stress, preventing complications, doing early crisis prevention and early crisis management, because so often these people are seriously ill. Somebody with serious congestive heart failure, for those of you clinicians, you know, ejection fractions in the 20 or, or percent or less, it's not a matter of if they're going to have a crisis, it's sort of a matter of when, right? We have to be on top of that. They have to have layered plans to know what to do uh, when shortness of breath occurs, and who to call, and what to do if that doesn't work. And we have to be utterly responsive. When people are at home, we need to involve not just our own staff, but EMS, who shares catchment with people in the community, if, with us, with people caring for some of the sickest patients in the healthcare system in community. Family support, counseling and anticipatory guidance. That's a pediatric term that I borrowed that I think is really wonderful, because this is a difficult time in life for individuals and families, but it's a normal time in life. We don't send neonates home from the hospital with mom saying, hey, give us a call if any questions arise. That's negligence, it's sort of abandonment. 
But we do that commonly when elderly folks are seriously ill people. Hey, give us a call if any problems arise. Well, could we have a little more guidance on that? Because we've never been through this before. This is our first time around. But you guys do this day in and day out. Could you tell us, please, like what to expect? You get the point. Alleviation of symptoms and suffering are our first priorities for human beings who are facing the end of life. But they're not our ultimate goals. Now, for the medical profession, alleviation of symptoms and suffering are the ultimate goals because they're looking through the lens of medicine. But I just explained, and I think you probably agree, that this is intensely personal. Within the realm of the person, there are lots of goals that can be accomplished through the end of life that have meaning and value for people going through them. There are opportunities to communicate bad news and sad feelings, to share you know, sad feelings among the people who matter most to you to complete your relationships and affairs, to, yes, get the will uh, you know, uh, changed or updated, to transfer the title on the you know, uh, uh, car or the deed for the house, to finally give people access to your accounts, give them your passwords, please, please. You'll save them a lot of you know, complicated grief but also in the personal realm, to resolve previously strained relationships, perhaps between a father and son who haven't spoken in years, perhaps between you know, previous spouses who were married for 20 years but have been, you know, went through a bitter divorce and now have been separated for the last 12 years. When one or the other is facing the end of life, it may matter for them to get back in touch. Not always, but you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, at how often when I mention to somebody, I understand you've been married before, does your husband, your previous husband, even know you've been ill? Would it matter for you to get in touch? Well, yeah, it's almost as if, well, yeah, you read my mind. How'd you know that? Well, because it matters to many people. It doesn't, it's not a requirement, but it often matters. And we can help you to get in touch. We can help you to start a letter or a conversation, if you so wish wish, to grieve together the impending loss of life and relationship, to review one's life, to tell one's stories, and in so doing to make meaning about the, in, in the present day, in this moment, about how your life feels to you, to explore those realms of connection to something larger than ourselves which will endure into an open-ended future, which is my definition of spirituality, some felt connection to something larger than myself, which will endure into an open-ended future, is a source of pure meaning. If you're a religious person, that may well be your relationship with God, a deeply, intensely personal relationship. For many of us, it's our relationship with nature, with the forests, with the trees, with the streams, with the ocean. For many of us, it's our relationship with our country, country we hope will live on for many, 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 many generations, centuries into the future. For many of us, it's it, part of our connection to family is a spiritual connection because we hope our families, will, which is larger than ourselves, will endure into an open-ended future. Relationships matter a lot. I learned a long time ago that before any important, certainly intimate relationship is complete, people often find value in saying at least four things to one another. Please forgive me, I forgive you, because there hasn't been a perfect relationship in the history of the planet. <laughs> Even the most close and loving relationships often are marked by hurt feelings, misunderstandings, and let's face it, sometimes real transgressions. Please forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you. Often thank you and I love you is stating the obvious, but boy, is it ever of value to do it here. Relationships can be complete without ending. I mean, this is part of good relational hygiene in many, many ways, making sure that on any given day, you know, there's nothing left unsaid, critically important left unsaid, if you or the person you love were to die. You don't have to be dying for these words to matter, you just have to be mortal. And if you're not mortal, if you're gonna live forever, if you love people who are mortal, you're still at risk of having them dying with important things left unsaid. Of course, the best care possible takes a functioning health care system. And as we saw, just think about that comment I read from about Steve Jobs, oi, have we got problems here. We don't have a highly functioning health care system to live in. We do have a schema for improving a health care system, and that's useful. 
Avidas Donabidian, the father of quality improvement in healthcare, said famously years ago, we need detailed information about the causal linkages among the structural attributes of the settings in which care occurs, the processes of care, and the outcomes of care. We've been using that structure, process, outcome schema, still using it in modified fashion today to do continuous quality improvement in healthcare, using measured data, measured outcomes to improve quality. We've got lots to do, and we've been doing hard work. We've moved, you know, I mean, we're laboring under a fee-for-service system, which, um, which was developed when phones still had dials. And doctors' offices were the de facto center of the healthcare system, right? And, and in fee-for-service healthcare, the more you do, the more revenue you generate. Doctor who's busiest, a hospital who's busiest, does better financially. But things have changed. We know phones no longer have dials, and doctors' offices are rarely the de facto healthcare system in a community. Now, healthcare is a very complex enterprise. We need to shift from volume to quality, from, you know, from um, the more is better to accountable, measured quality is better. We're calling this value based healthcare. It's no longer what you charge, but what you spend as a healthcare system that matters. As long as quality is there, if you can do it for less, well, that's a good thing, and we're going to applaud and celebrate what you do. Continuity and prevention, the sorts of things that care managers and social workers and many of us in primary care have been doing for years, all of a sudden has stature, as it should have all along. This is important for the personal care of human beings. The challenge will be to keep the doctor and patient or the clinician and patient in this mix because that relationship is still key to quality. Shared decision making is an irreducible component of quality. We know that we can do this well and still be fiscally responsible. This is actual real data from Dartmouth Hitchcock's palliative care program. I show it with permission. And, and we don't need to look at the numbers, not in this session. We'll be doing a little bit more of that in some roundtables. But for inpatients who, we are, who the Dartmouth Hitchcock Palliative Care Service sees, the costs per patient per day in the hospital drop by $500 or so per patient per day. We're not talking people out of treatments, not our job. I would be you know, critical if any clinician uh, in the palliative care service try to talk people out of things. It's, we don't have an agenda. It's not about us. Our agenda actually is to have the shared decision-making conversation, to clarify goals of care, to provide, help a family come to a plan of care that is consistent with their values, preferences, and priorities, and achievable health care outcomes. Hospice, now we know from research that was done in, uh, in this state, partly, um, saves money for uh, Medicare at whatever length of service hospice is able to um, serve the patient and family. This is recent data because it used to be thought that you had to serve a family between um, uh, 70, well, 70 days was the sweet spot, it's like 30 to 105 days to actually save money. No, any, we already save Medicare money, though Medicare isn't, hasn't said thank you for a long time. <laughs> Mostly they want to know why patients live so long when the median length of service is 14 days and falling. So we need to get active. The best care takes families and communities. You know, notice that the word family and community in meaning are actually more verbs than nouns. You know, they're about mutuality, about responsiveness to one another, about caring for one another. That's why I'm here. I didn't come just to give a talk. I came to contribute to a community-based effort to take back ownership of this time of personal life. Meet Harry and Shirley. Some of you who are clinicians, they'll be very familiar. You know, Harry is an older man with Parkinson's Plus, a little prostate cancer, and some memory loss. He sort of shuffles, and he's, he's not fully independent, and he's, a, you know, he's frail. Shirley, and they've been married for 62 years, has diabetes, congestive heart failure, hypertension, some osteoporosis, some spinal stenosis, and macular degeneration. Now, she's frail too, but Harry and Shirley fit really well together. Why? Because they grew together. 
Now, currently, we don't see Harry or Shirley until Harry falls and breaks a hip or Shirley has a stroke at which point 911 is called and cost is no object. They get the best medical treatments at all costs. But we might have really helped Harry and Shirley to live better and frankly to live longer had we been able as a caring community to see them as a frail elderly couple living at home independently. We might have been able to get in and serve them. Maybe we, they could have signed a waiver so that the Meals on Wheels person can report back to some community coordinator about how they're doing. Maybe so that the mailman has the permission to call somebody up if they, he notes that they haven't picked up their mail. So that a child in, in uh, third grade uh, in a program of connecting seniors, particularly those who are living uh, independently at home, to young children, call up and just do a check-in, and if Harry or Shirley don't answer the phone, somebody goes out and sees why, right? There's many things we could do. If we could see them earlier, we might have been able to get a ramp up to the stairs and grab bars on the walls, including in their bathroom, before Harry fell. Maybe we could have gotten those damn throw rugs off of the floors, which are just hazardous to elderly folks, before they had an, an event. We could have, you know, checked, um, um, Shirley's blood pressure more commonly at home. You get the point. They're not patients, they're human beings, whole persons living at home. And family is a verb. The noun part of family doesn't depend on bloodline or marriage alone. It's really defined by this phrase, for whom it matters. If you matter to me and I matter to you, we're family. Certainly from the notion of both medicine and a careful community, a caring community. <coughs> Dwight Eisenhower said years ago, if a problem cannot be solved, enlarge it. I suggest that we haven't fixed the problem, we haven't solved the problem of medical care for people facing the end of life. Let's enlarge it. This isn't about medicine primarily, it's about living fully through the very end of life. I think our branding has been terrible in hospice and palliative care. We, we, um, we talk about um, the dying as if they weren't us right? They're all us. You know, you know human, the human condition has been, been described as a, a terminal condition, uh, yeah, which is sexually transmitted, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, a sexually transmitted uh, disease with a terminal condition. It's about living, you know? The best care possible. That's better than, a, you know, would you like a good death? No, thank you very much, I'll take the bad life. <laughs> We're all gonna be dead a long time, I think I'll stay here, you know? But what we do know is people want the best care possible. That, I think, is our brand. It's what I do. Um, think about what I talked about, about the opportunities. It's not just ending a life, it's about completing a life. Making sure that there's nothing critically important left undone or unsaid. Notice how this may raise cultural expectations, let you know what's possible. I use the phrase dying well. When you first hear that phrase, uh, well sounds like an adverb, and it is an adverb, modifying or describing the experience or the process of dying. Fair enough. But it's also an adjective, defining the person who is dying. Can a person be well even as they are facing the end of life? Well, yeah. I mean, that's what I write stories about. It's possible for people not only to be well, but to become more well within themselves through this time of life we would consider them to be dying. To say the things that matter most, to make you know, amends for previous transgressions, to celebrate you know, uh, what matters most in their life, their, their loved ones. Um, Wherever you stand on the issue of, you know, uh, physician-assisted suicide, this phrase, death with dignity, is, is really troublesome to me. Because it sends a cultural message that unless you die with your boots or your makeup on, somehow you're not dignified. But seriously ill and dying people are already dignified. I mean, that's not my assertion. You know, after World War II in 1948, the UN Declaration Universal Declaration of Human Rights made it very clear that all members of the human community are inherently dignified. Just think of the setting in which this was done. 
all these countries came together to ratify and make it clear forevermore that in human ethics, human beings are inherently dignified. We need to honor and celebrate people's inherent dignity through the very end of life. That's the work that we do as a caring community instead of caring professionals, but also everybody in the community. I love, I met two or three people who are working in parish nursing or Stephen's ministry. That's what you're doing. When somebody is becoming frail, elderly or sick and frail, and they can't walk the stairs or they can't make their own meals or, heaven forbid, can't you know, clean themselves, we hold their dignity in relationship. As their independence falls, we support them so that their inherent dignity can be seen in the way that we provide care as a community, as care providers representing a larger community. They need to be able to see their dignity, their inherent dignity reflected in our eyes. This is a human's construct. In addition to people simply dying, you know, without pain or suffering, we can honor and celebrate people through this difficult but ultimately critically important and valuable time of human life. This is about living fully. Remember Avitas Donabidian I, I introduced to you as the father of quality improvement in healthcare. Well, when Dr. Donabidian was dying himself of prostate cancer, he was interviewed by Fitzhugh Mullen for Health Affairs, and he said, ultimately, the secret of quality is love. You have to love your patient, you have to love your profession. He added, you have to love your God. If you have love, you can then work backward to monitor and improve the system. You get it? You know, it's okay, by the way, and we'll talk about this later with the clinicians in training, the students, medical nursing and other students. It's okay to love our patients. That's actually a pure, you know, this isn't about sex, right? How bizarre is that thought? You know, this is about actively loving people because they're worthy of our love and attention. Tender loving care is still the sine qua non of excellence in, in our culture. And I can find nothing in the canons of medical ethics or law that disallows human love. It's okay to love one's patients, to love the community, to love one another. What I'm going to be doing with the roundtables today is using this sort of very, very simple quality improvement tool or strategic planning tool to look at, you know, what do we hope for, for ourselves or our clients or patients in the future, for our children and grandchildren living fully through the end of life? What do we hope for? What is our current perspective of what we get? Now, in certain circles, this is, you know, well, what is our mission statement, and what are our standards, and what do we measure, right? But in general, it's just what do we hope for, and, and, and soliciting, like, ideas about what that would look like, and what is your current experience, either your subjective experience, or what does the data tell us about what we're currently getting? And then let's look at how we can narrow that gap. In some roundtables, we're going to be looking at the barriers that keep us from moving from you know, uh, what we are currently experiencing or getting to what we hope for in the future. And how can we address those, uh, those uh, barriers? How can we dissolve them or get around them or turn them to allies? But the key lesson that I want to leave everybody with, well, there's several. This is personal, it's not just medical. But also that what we have proven, although we, a crisis still persists, we know now, and so much of the leadership has come from this state, from some people sitting in this room, we know now that much better care is both feasible and affordable. If anybody thinks money is a barrier, it's simply not. It's just going to the wrong places. We have plenty of money in the system to take much better care of people, and we know how to do it. We're simply not doing it. I suggest that as hospice and palliative care providers, which I know many of you are, we've been trying to stand on a two-legged stool in improving you know, care and quality of life for people through the end of life. We have well demonstrated that we can improve quality quite dramatically and diminish costs at least modestly, but not trivially. So we've got that. 
what we've been missing is demand for what we want. People don't want what we have to offer. In hospice, you know, it's a brilliant system of care, but you've got to give up treatments for your disease to get this brilliant you know, level of care for your comfort and quality of life. It's not enough to be dying in America to get hospice. Under Medicare, you also have to agree you are dying, something which people are reluctant to do. And you have to give up treatment for your cancer, your heart failure, or something else that may really have value and is getting harder to do because the cancer and congestive heart failure and COPD and you know, other treatments are getting better and better. So let me suggest that although the crisis suggests and the data suggests that many, many people are still receiving bad care through the very last stages of their life, most of them don't even know it. And that makes it difficult to move and do quality improvement as a community or as a health system. My question is, why don't we tell them? I mean, I know that's provocative, but doesn't it seem socially responsible? People are dying badly, and we in hospice and palliative care are saying, well, we'll just educate. We just need to educate. You know, we have to wait. You know, no, I would suggest that the time for incremental change has passed. This is not as provocative as it used to be. Remember, we now have a taxonomy for quality. The Institute of Medicine and our boards of, so many boards of, uh, of medicine and, and specialty groups have given us a framework for quality, which means that we also now have a framework for low quality. We know we can categorize some things that are simply bad care. And we need to explain in the nicest, most polite ways, because I got to tell you, I know that everybody involved in this has good intentions, really and truly. So it's not their intentions. They're not bad people. But bad things are happening. That's pretty unequivocally you know, supported. So why don't we tell them? Some things public policies can do. You know, if you want people to be dignified and feel dignified, we have to increase staffing in nursing homes. We have to increase payment for people, compensation for people in nursing homes. It's not okay that nursing homes have a 70 to 90% turnover of nurses and aides in a given year. That's not the substrate for quality. We need to require adequate staffing, which would almost be doubling the staffing in most nursing homes, and provide living wages for an aid level worker. If we really are serious about dignity among dying people, then let's make sure there's enough people to answer the bell when a frail elder needs, to, needs help in getting to the bathroom or is wet and needs to be changed. There's no, you know, they, before we write the lethal prescription, could we make sure there's enough aids to get them to the bathroom? We need to set realistic training standards for physicians, nurses, and allied clinicians. At least curriculum parity with the beginning of life. We teach every medical student now how to deliver babies. Something like 200 hours of obstetrics is, a, is required. And, and I love women's health, and I have delivered many babies myself and was glad to be trained in it, but I was trained during my family practice residency. Every physician who delivers babies in practice in this you know, new world will have gone through a family medicine or OBGYN residency. Every four-year medical student probably doesn't need 200 hours of obstetrics. Nowadays, we, train, we, we do very little training in hospice and palliative medicine. Only a few medical schools require training in hospice and palliative medicine. So I think, why not split the difference? 200 hours, you know, we have 200 hours for obstetrics. Let's take 100 hours for obstetrics and teach 100 hours of hospice and palliative medicine. I mean, you know, let's just face it. Only 50% of the uh, population is at real risk of having the obstetrical experience. But last time I checked, 100% of Americans will eventually die. And the large majority of physicians will be involved in their, in their care. Let's eliminate the ridiculous requirement that people must give up treatments for their disease to get hospice care for their comfort, quality of life, and their family support. That was not, that's not you know, in the hospice philosophy. It, it's simply not. It's in, you know, it was given to us not by God, but by Congress which required through a Medicare statute that you give up treatment for your disease to get hospice care. We can change that. It's time to change that. We now know that that requirement was intended to save money, but it actually costs more money and gives us poorer quality care through the end of life. And finally, it's time to require a palliative care consultation be before we take people to high-risk surgery like aortic valve surgery for a demented 84-year-old. 
which is what the cover of this magazine was about, or you know, salvage chemotherapy for somebody who, whose cancer has uh, grown through the third, fourth, and fifth rounds of chemotherapy. You get the point. But our real work, and the real reason I am so delighted to be with you here today, is that the real work is in cultural maturation. It's time for our culture to grow the rest of the way up. We're gonna die. <gasps> Let's get over it. And get on with living as fully, as joyfully, as richly as possible through the very end of life. Those of us who are boomers, we've done this before. When I was growing up, born in 1951, I was, I was born under general anesthesia, right? Pregnancy and childbirth were medical events. When I was growing up, this was a medical event. And when we boomers were starting to have babies, we took it back. We demanded better medical treatment for pregnancy and childbirth, but we said this is not fundamentally medical, this is fundamentally personal for the woman, obviously the infant, and the family. And so we demanded better medical care, and prenatal care went from, from you know, just being checking the urine for protein and the blood pressure for hypertension to really a full assessment of the persons whose pregnancy help, peak nutrition, exercise, sexuality. Yes, prepared childbirth through Lamaze and La Leche League classes and getting the fathers into the delivery rooms. And look what changed. I mean, it changed dramatically in like a decade, driven mostly by the community, by citizens and consumers. Medicine first pushed back. Well, we can't let, you know, pay, uh, uh, we can't let husbands in the delivery room because you know, they'll faint and fall over and they'll get in the way and you know, they'll hurt themselves. And no, it turned out that ultimately the data showed that the results of prepared childbirth were better than the results of unprepared childbirth for all of the various people involved, all of the stakeholder groups. And thankfully, medicine climbed on board and helped accelerate the change to really person-centered you know, prenatal and, and uh, delivery care. And it's become a you know, whole, healthy, wholesome, personal experience for individuals and families. We took it back successfully. Let me suggest that that's exactly the same process that now we boomers need to contribute to in taking back this difficult, hard, unwanted often, but entirely normal time of life. There is such a thing as healthy living through the very end of life. We see it in hospice and palliative care, but we don't tell people about it. We talk about the good death, and you know, death is beyond life, it's a lifeless state. I think we should be talking about dying well, honoring and celebrating, you know, really enriching, completing a life, celebrating not just individual lives, but the lives of our families. This is the future. This is our bright future. This is the future that we can usher in, not by you know, putting ourselves in opposition to the best medical treatments, no, by absorbing the best medical treatments within the framework of the personal. You know, so often we talk about creation as something that happened in biblical times, but we know that creation is still happening. The astrophysicists are abuzz, you know, by redescribing the Big Bang or the cold swoosh or whatever it's now being called. But but they tell us that the universe is quite literally expanding. Creation is ongoing. Certainly, the creation of our social and cultural environments is ongoing. We are not passive recipients. We are certainly not solely victims of the culture and society. We can be active, creative participants in creating a new world for all of us to live and grow in, for all of us to die from, but, but for our children, and our children's children to live in. Life is precious, it is fleeting, but it is worth honoring and celebrating and living fully. That's the work that's there to be done. Thank you all for the work you've done in this remarkable community coming together for this day. Thank you, President Hayes and the Parmenter Foundation honoring choices. And thank you for allowing me to be part of shaping this day and contributing as a catalyst to cultural change going forward. It's exciting to be here. I look forward to the day, and I look forward to learning from all of you in the months and, and years ahead. Thank you.
Thanks. So we have some time for questions. Yes? We have a little bit of time for questions, and, and um, some of us will have a full day of, of nitty-gritty conversations. Because this is not the end. This really is the beginning. In each of your faith communities, in each of your neighborhoods, in your places of work, this needs to be, you know, these need to be topics for ongoing conversation and ongoing quality improvement. So let's begin. Questions? And it can be critical, by the way. I'm, my feelings won't be hurt if you disagree. No. <laughs> I don't want to be critical. But I do want to know, as a consumer, how do we get around the fact that you guys can't seem to get together on the differences between palliative care and hospice care? That's making it difficult for consumers. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think you're right. Um, I think uh, there's the uh, language is being used in an inexact fashion. Um, I, um, you know, palliative care and hospice are, uh, have, this, have a single set of parents. They came from the same womb, right? Um, hospice care is palliative care for people who these days, under Medicare's uh, definitions, who are dying and acknowledge that their, that their condition has a life expectancy of six months or left, less if it runs its natural course. So it's a delivery model of palliative care. It was the original delivery model, and palliative care has grown from that to encompass a larger field that has, brings the knowledge base and the skill set of hospice to people during the course of a serious illness. So I'm sorry it's confusing, but hospice, unfortunately, nowadays is, is too strictly defined by its payment mechanisms and by the, by the, by the insurers or Medicare or whomever which is putting further restrictions on access to this delivery of palliative care. And palliative care is, you know, is available more generally. To be quite frank, though, you know, if you've seen one palliative care program, you've seen one palliative care program. Because there are yet to be formal standards. So it's nice that there are 82% of hospitals that have palliative care programs, but if you dig deeper into, well, what is that staffing? Uh, who staffs the palliative care program? When are they available? Will they see us in an ICU? Will they see us in the emergency department? Can you call them after hours? Well, then you get really, it starts to, you know, get diverse. Um, so all of this is important because all of this could be published on websites. I would love to see a website where each hospital is forced <coughs> by the Joint Commission or by the Medicare or somebody to list not only if they have a palliative care program, but what the staffing is, when they're available, you know? what you should expect if you're referred to our palliative care program, so that consume, citizen consumers can decide where they want their loved one's cancer care to be, or congestive heart failure care to be. And if not, if, you're, if, they're, if they're going to X hospital and the palliative care is threadbare, they can complain in a data-driven fashion. Comparing, comparing where it is there to where it is in somebody that's, that's more robust, like I will say, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, which has a quite robust palliative care program. You get the point. But, it's, but your point is very well taken. Yeah. Um, yes. You, this agitated lady. <laughs> Animated, I mean. I'm sorry. Uh, could you comment on the most um, issue that is, according to other conferences have gone to to be timely in Massachusetts and how uh, doctors who are already caring or who have been in, in practice for many years are getting the message if they are. I, well, so the, the Honoring Choices people will probably tell you, be able to tell you more about where it is. Most is medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, which, which conveys the discussion with patients and or patients' families. Um, conveying what, they, what their values, preferences, and priorities are in a real-time fashion so that coming, instead of having it be only in an advanced directive or living will or power of attorney for health care, which is a contingency document, which is usually not in force until something else happens, right? Until I become critically ill and unable to speak for myself, my living will or, or durable power of attorney form isn't, in, it isn't active. It's a contingency document. The most form is a physician or clinician's order 
that is active today that conveys the values and preferences and priorities into a medical order that is actionable right now. So it's a very useful development. It's particularly useful for, people, for patients in long-term care, and it addresses things like CPR, whether they want uh, uh, to be re-hospitalized and under what circumstances, um, what, what they would want in terms of dialysis for if their kidneys fail, medically administered nutrition and hydration if they could no longer eat, antibiotics for fevers and all of those sorts of, sorts of things. So it's a very, very useful uh, development and it, and it, you know, it is, um, again, it, it, it um, uh, dissolves some of the uncertainty around advanced directives in, in real time use. It is connected to a national uh, movement uh, the pulsed paradigm, which is um, adapting, helping states adapt and, and adopt um, this paradigm for each, um, for each state and making it their own. I, I, it's happening in New Hampshire now too. I think it's a positive, um, I think it's a positive development. We've got time for two more questions, I'm told. Thank you for that. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thanks. I'm going to shift things a little bit. I wanted to ask your best advice for being more proactive politically in helping to move the bar at a national level when things are so polarized in Washington. You'll recall the death panel talk yeah. before. I think to open the conversation, we have to depoliticize some of the end of life care. Yes. So thank you for the question. You're absolutely right. Um, I think. For one thing, I, I don't see a lot of leadership coming from Washington in any direction, frankly. I mean, uh, that's tragic, frankly. I, you know, I, I think we have to take it back at a local community level and at a state level. There's great leadership in this state. I mean, Dr. Faroe is sitting here and he's chairing the governor's panel. I think he would tell you that they've made significant recommendations and some progress, but not nearly enough. So there's some polarizing things, there are some barriers, some of which are political even here. I frankly would suggest that you could work here best and then show Washington what's possible when a, when a state takes ownership of its own well-being. Um, uh, what I usually say to people, and I, I'm, in the, uh, I'm a proud, lifelong political progressive, um, but I often find myself um, working hand in glove with uh, very socially conservative uh, people who, because we agree on end of life care or care through the end of life, that it needs to be medically competent, you know, honor people's values, preferences, and priorities, that it's personal, not just medical, and that people have inherent dignity. They don't have to die with their boots or makeup on to become dignified. So I find myself with, in, it's, in a sense, they're odd bedfellows me and the evangelical you know, group. But we get along really well and we work together because frankly, what I like to say is, um, uh, you know, when natural disasters strike, when Hurricane Sandy struck um, New Jersey, you, what you saw was people coming together and moving re reflexively together to high common ground, right? They didn't ask, well, what's your politics? This happened just before the presidential election. Right? In, in, in 2012, well, you know, who are you voting for? They didn't ask that, you know? They moved together because we're all in this one together. Let me suggest that death is the natural disaster that awaits us all. So while we continue to disagree about taxes and voting rights and all kinds of other stuff, which I feel strongly about and would love to argue with people about, not today, but you know, but, but death is the natural disaster that awaits us all. Could we at least work together for this one? I suggest that we all already stand on high common ground. We all love one another. We love our families. Those of us who are clinicians, whether we're Republican or Democrat or Tea Partiers or whatever, we all want the best care for our patients. So let's just think about that and set the politics aside on, on this one issue. Or continue to fight about, you know, I, I, I fight long and hard in opposition to legalizing physician-assisted suicide. But I'll sit down and talk with people who, who oppose me on this issue about curriculum change, about you know, Medicare transformation, about making hospice care available to all. You know, we shouldn't be disagreeing on this, and in fact, we don't. Well, let's work together on this one while we still vigorously debate and disagree about other stuff. That's possible for adults to do. And I think it's the, that's where the opportunities lie. One more question. 
thank you for your talk. Um, I, I'm a physician at Boston University. My name is Suzanne Mitchell. And um, I have a question about branding, because I know that it's getting popular to rename palliative care to supportive care. Yeah. And I don't know if that's good or not, because I know there's the Grim Reaper kind of picture in everybody's mind when you walk in their room and you say you're from palliative care. I say I'm Dr. Feelgood. I, I don't even use palliative care. I've been thrown out of rooms for that. But supportive care might confuse things. I wonder what you think about the changing of palliative care yeah. to supportive care. I think it's more important what we do than what we call one another. Uh, so when I first went to Dartmouth, now a decade or more ago, uh, they, many clinicians said, if we call it palliative care, they, 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 I can't get you in the room. They won't do it. You know, let's call it something else. And I said, well, you know, okay, but what are you going to call it? You know, if we could call it the rainbow program. But if what we were really doing was, taking, was, was, was doing end-of-life care only, within two years of marketing the rainbow program, you will be coming to me and say, don't mention rainbows in the room because they don't want it in. You know. I said, you know, it's palliative care. We have now we're a formal specialty. And the right answer for that time, and I'm not going to stick to this because I don't know what the right answer is in each institution. I really don't. But the right answer at that time was to change the meaning of what palliative care meant at Dartmouth. Because we're not just for dying. We're for anybody who's seriously ill. You don't have to be dying to get us. You just have to be mortal. Okay? If you're mortal and seriously ill, we're there to help you. And I was, it was tested multiple times by, by um, uh, a cancer specialist who said, well, Ira, this guy is, you know, he has stage four disease, but he wants to go for salvage chemotherapy. You, want, you guys want to see him? Yeah, absolutely. Or the critical care doctor says, Doc, you know, Ira, this guy is, has multi-system organ failure, but the family really wants him to stay on the vent and to get, you know, get all these treatments. Do you want to follow them too? Absolutely. We are there to walk the you know, walk with patients and families and give the best care possible we can. That's palliative care. And nowadays at Dartmouth, I hear oncologists and critical care doctors saying, well, palliative care here means that we're giving you the best care possible. We need them involved to give you the best cancer care we can. So it, it, partly we change the meaning of what the word meant there. And I suggest that whatever you call it, call it supportive care, Call it rainbow care, call it whatever, but make sure you're caring for whole persons and families through the end of life without forcing them to be dying to get your service. And then it won't be there, the sting won't be there. You know, what I've schooled uh, the oncologist to say is it's not about you, your prognosis, it's about our standards. For me to care for you with pancreatic cancer, to give you the best care, I need this team involved too takes the sting out of it. We do this for everyone. That takes the sting out of it. So I know that this, this will go on for a while, this, this wrestling with terms. And I, I used to think it was really important that we stick to the term palliative. I, I think more now it, it, it's what it means. And I frankly, let me just say that I think as important as palliative care and hospice are, they are merely instrumental. They are not the goal itself. The goal itself is providing the best care we possibly can to persons and their families. So I would rather have an institution adopt a, as a strategic initiative, giving the best whole person care possible, and then have our metrics all turn on what is the best person-centered care at, for each disease group or each you know, client we serve and then see hospice and palliative care as being instrumental to raising that measured quality. That would be, for me, to feel like we're working together because there'll never be enough of us to care for every patient in the ICU and every patient with cancer. It really has to be systematized. It's not, not about us as, as palliative care or hospice do docs or clinicians. It's about the people we serve. And in that, we ought to be right together, shoulder to shoulder with the interventionalists, and every other medical specialty team. I think we're done. Thank you so very much. But you've just begun. Thank you for being here. I look forward to following your progress in the months ahead. Oh, good. Oh. All right. You all have them in your bag. Envisioning and achieving a brighter future. Future so bright we have to wear shades. Let me use this again. <laughs>
Uh, please join us in the gallery for a uh, gathering around pastoral care skills for those of you who are interested. Thank you all. Thank you.